I think sometimes we mistake God's silence for God being absent, which is why we need to understand the Holy Spirit and the promise Jesus gave us that he would never leave us alone, that when he ascended to heaven, he would give us the Holy Spirit. But what I wanna ask you today is, do you sense the Holy Spirit? Not just when you walk into church, I hope you get it there, but, but in your life, each and every day, all the time, or are you ghosting the Holy Ghost? Today, we're gonna to start off kind of the next collection in this season, all about the Holy Spirit. We're calling it, you ready? Ghosted. Turn to your neighbor and say, ghosted. Ghosted. Now, that word means something today, doesn't it? Have you ever been ghosted? You ever texted somebody and the little bubbles pop up, but then the bubbles go away and they don't say anything? And you're like, now come on. I know you were typing. I saw the bubbles. But they ghost you. They don't say anything. That's what the word ghosted means. It means somebody didn't pick up the phone. They didn't answer your call. They didn't answer your text. Sometimes ghosted today just means somebody who, you're like, where'd they go? They ghosted, they just disappeared from your life, right? Now here's the deal. Sometimes it feels that way with God. Can we get real? Sometimes it feels like you've been praying your guts out and God just left you hanging. Like, is, is God even there? Is God ghosting me? Mistake God's silence for God being absent, which is why we need to understand the Holy Spirit and the promise Jesus gave us that he would never leave us alone, that when he ascended to heaven, he would give us the Holy Spirit. So when you feel ghosted by God, remember that. Remember that you have, if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. God doesn't ghost us. God, in another way, actually has ghosted us. Because when you come to faith in Jesus, he gives you the Holy Ghost. But God doesn't leave us. God doesn't forsake us. And I'll show you what Jesus said about this. Interesting, this happens right before the initial steps of him going to the cross, dying for us, resurrecting, kind of setting the church up for about 40 days, and then ascending into heaven. Before that whole thing starts, here's what Jesus says. This is right before he's betrayed and arrested. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you, he doesn't say a helper, he says another helper. Right. He's saying a helper of the same kind, just like I have been. Another helper to be with you, check it out, forever. Now, they're all sitting, they don't know what's about to happen. They're all sitting there, what? What do you mean, forever? But we understand it, don't we? Another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. So you have to know Jesus to receive the Holy Spirit. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So I always say, Jesus was God in a bod, Right? the incarnation, the enfleshing of God, the birth of Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas. Why do we celebrate it? Well, because God left his throne room and came to be with us in human form, God in a bod. But then Jesus died on the cross, resurrected, ascended to heaven. And now we don't have God in a bod. We have something maybe even better. We have God in our bods, in a way. Because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. What Jesus was to the 12 disciples, the Holy Spirit is to the church today. He is our wisdom. He is our strength. He is our power. He is our comfort. He's the wind in our sails. He's the oxygen of the fire of the kingdom of God. Come on, somebody. But so many Christians ghost the Holy Ghost, never responding to his power, never responding to his presence, never receiving his joy, his comfort, the great gift that he is. Now, if you go study the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, you see Pentecost. That's the day that the church was born. But if you continue to read the book of Acts, there's this story, and it happens about 20 to 25 years after the church is birthed. Paul goes to speak at a church, and he's speaking at this church, and he's, he's sensing something's off, but he can't figure out what it is. 
He's like, is it the lights? Is it the sound? Is it the song selection? Is it that crazy drummer back there in the cage? Rah, rah, rah. Like, what, what? Is it the kids' ministry? I can't figure, something's, something's not right at this church. And then it hits him. He realizes they're ghosting the Holy Ghost. So he confronts them on it, and their response is hilarious. They say, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Nobody had taught them. Nobody had told them. They had the Holy Ghost in Christ, but were living, grieving the Holy Spirit. And sadly, that's kind of like a lot of Christians in the world and in church today. They walk in, they think church is about this stuff. Light, sound, music, kids ministry, student ministry. Listen, in a sense, yes, those are all incredible tools that the Holy Spirit uses to help us, to guide us, to change us. Amen? And I want you to make some noise for our teams because they're doing a great job leading all those different ministries. I'm so proud of what God is doing in our church right now as it pertains to leaders and leadership and people stepping up and learning their spiritual gifts and getting connected and ministering. But what I want to ask you today is, do you sense the Holy Spirit? Not just when you walk into church, I hope you get it there, but, but in your life, each and every day, all the time. Or are you ghosting the Holy Ghost? How sad that we would ghost the Holy Ghost, that we would ignore the power and presence of God in our lives. So today we're going to get a little more theological with some application at the end. Come back the next few weeks. We'll get even more heavy on application. I'm excited to study the Holy Spirit with you. And hopefully, if you don't really understand this part of your faith, help you begin to wrap your brain around it and experience the fullness of God's grace. The Holy Spirit's work is to complete and to sustain what God the Father has planned and what God the Son set in motion when he came to this world. The work of the Holy Spirit is to manifest the active presence of God in the world today, especially in his church. Remember, church is us, God's people. The Holy Spirit is a member of the Trinity. He's always been there. You read just the first two verses of Genesis and you see the Holy Spirit. He's a member of the Trinity, Old Testament, New Testament. And usually when you encounter the Holy Spirit in the scriptures, most often he represents as being present to do God's work in the world. That's usually what we see. Again, all through the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, but especially true, maybe true in a full way in the new covenant, which is what we're a part of as believers in Jesus. In the Old Testament, the presence of God was usually manifested in the glory of God, and it would happen in what we call theophanies, if you want the theological term, theophanies. That just means a visible manifestation of God's presence to humans. But then in the New Testament, you get to those gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Jesus. Jesus Christ himself was manifested as the presence of God among men. But now, since Jesus ascended to heaven, it's like the Holy Spirit picked up the football and he's the one running down the field, moving the church forward, if you know what I'm saying. Now it's the Holy Spirit that is the primary manifestation of the presence of the Trinity among us. And so you see how incredibly important it is for us to understand how he works in the world today, how he has worked in the past, how he wants to work in and through us. Let's look at the work of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 Paul says, such were some of you, he's talking about sin. He's like, yeah, that used to be you. And he says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of our God. So the Holy Ghost, first thing, he purifies. It's the Holy Spirit that purifies us from sin, making us more holy, making us more like Jesus. Interesting, the Holy Spirit begins this work even before you come to faith in Jesus. Jesus said in John 16, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe. So even before you were a believer, or if you're here today and you're not a believer, whether you realize it or not, the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. He is moving in your life. That's how much God loves you. So much that even before you've declared you love him, even before you said yes to him, he's still moving in your life. John the Baptist said in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, that Jesus would baptize us with the Holy Spirit and fire. If Jesus said it, I want it. Anybody else want it? 
If Jesus said, here's a gift, I want the gift. If Jesus said, hey, I'm giving you this, I want to make sure I receive what he's giving me. Then when we give our lives to Jesus, what happens is the Holy Spirit brings an even deeper cleansing to our lives. Salvation is that initial break away from sin, but the Spirit continues that work in us for the rest of our life as we grow in personal holiness, as we begin to produce the, Bible calls it the fruit of the Spirit. We're continually being transformed by the Spirit of God more and more into the image of Christ, 2 Corinthians 3.18. It's called sanctification. It's what you signed up for. The minute you said yes to Jesus, regeneration happened, boom, immediately followed by the beginning stages of sanctification, growing in holiness. Here's the thing. You can't do that by yourself. I can't do that by myself. It's the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. It's the Holy Spirit that helps us identify and put to death sinful habits, sinful ways of believing and living that God has called us to remove from our lives. And Jesus said, if you want to know if this is like happening in your life, it's pretty simple. There's a litmus test you can do. Look at the fruit. Matthew chapter 7. You will recognize them by their fruits. Every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. Look at the fruit of your life. Take stock of the fruit in your life, the spiritual fruit. Galatians 5 says it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's a great place to start. Amen, anybody? Like if I could just get half that list, I'd be doing pretty dang good. Amen? Look at the fruit. Does it line up with the Word of God? Is your life changing? My dad owned a coin shop growing up. One of the things he did to support our family was he sold gold and silver bullion. And he taught me a lot about gold when I was growing up. He taught me that Gold has to go through a refining process because when they dig the gold out of the ground or pull it out of the river, it's not very pure. It's got a lot of impurities in it. In fact, it's, it's kind of ugly. It's kind of dirty looking. Like, ladies, you would never want to wear impure gold on your finger. Like, it's just kind of ugly, right? It rubs off on you. It's brittle. It falls apart. It's not as strong as it should be. So what they do is they heat the gold up through the refining process using a furnace. And when they do, Interesting, all of the impurities rise up to the top and then they skim them off. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. As he purifies you, he wants to call things out so that those things can be dealt with and rise to the surface of your heart and then God can skim them off. Now, here's the thing about that. That doesn't sound very fun, does it? The refining process is not very fun. Things coming to the surface in your life that go against the character traits God wants us to have, our sin, our struggles, our weaknesses, demonic ways of believing, things we associate ourselves with that are hurting us, not helping us. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit. And here's what I love. This refining process that purifies us, it is a powerful, powerful process, but also the Holy Spirit does it in such a gentle way when you really think about it. It's gentle, but it's powerful to allow the Holy Spirit to convict you and confront you, to allow God through the Holy Spirit to say, here's something in your life, and because you're my son, you're my daughter, I have to talk about it. I have to call it out. We have to help this impurity rise to the top so you can become more like Christ. This thing, it's not leading you into blessings. It's leading you away from blessings. It's not fun to be refined by the fire. It's uncomfortable but it's necessary, and the results are worth it. The Holy Spirit purifies. The Holy Ghost also unifies. Look at 1 Corinthians 12. It says, just as the body, he's talking about the body of Christ, us, okay? Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. The Holy Ghost unifies. He unifies. Think of God's great church like a a sailboat. And we've got all these sails up in the air. And think of the Holy Spirit like the wind that hits those sails and makes the church move in the right direction. The beautiful thing is the wind is kind of hitting the sails from all these different little angles. But it's just one wind that powers the whole entire vessel. It's very much like that in God's church. The Holy Spirit 
fills you and guides you as an individual believer. The Holy Spirit gifts you with specific spiritual gifts, and yours are different than mine, and mine are different than yours. He gives you different experiences and wherewithal and things that you're good at and things that you intuitively understand, and yours are all different than mine, and yours are all different than the person on the road that you're, you're sitting on, but we're all moving in one direction. One spirit, one direction. We're moving in the direction of building God's kingdom one life at a time. But here's the thing. With no wind, the boat doesn't go anywhere. With no wind in the sails, the boat just drifts aimlessly. Without the Holy Spirit in a church, there's no real movement in the church. And that's what I love about the story of Pentecost, when the church was literally birthed. Because the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church, and this marked a very clear shift. The Spirit was now upon anybody who comes to faith in Jesus. And this created a brand new thing that had never existed called the church, that you and I are a part of today. This is when it all began. And also it united the church in a way that the world had re really never experienced or, or seen unity. And here's the crazy thing. Today, the Holy Spirit continues that same work in that same church. Strife and jealousy and division, those things come from the flesh. The Spirit leads us towards love as God's church, which binds everything perfectly together. When you see a church moving forward, what you're seeing is a church that's open and receptive to the Holy Spirit and the unity that the Holy Spirit brings. It changes things, and it's what our world needs right now. For God's great church, you and I to just be open and say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Have your way in and through my life and in and through the life of this body of believers called the church. The Holy Spirit purifies, he unifies, and the Holy Ghost also reveals. And I know I'm using ghost and spirit interchangeably. If you go read the King James, I think it says uh, ghost like 70 times and spirit like seven times, but then culture changed a little and without getting on too much of a rabbit trail, you know, ghost started to mean a different thing because Halloween. So anyway, we started saying spirit a little more. 1 Corinthians 12, just as the body is one, I'm sorry, John 16, John 16, this is Jesus. He says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So the Holy Spirit reveals. He reveals. He, he always has revealed. He still is revealing things to us. He helps us see things we can't see on our own. He helps us know and understand things that we can't know and understand on our own. He, he reveals things like God's will, God's plan for our lives, God's presence each and every day. Without him, we're really just kind of in the dark, stumbling around. A lot of times during the week when I get up to the church, maybe nobody's been here yet, this room's completely dark, y'all. There's no windows in here. I don't know if you noticed that. Like when this room's dark, it is dark. You can't see nothing. I can't tell you how many times I've come in this room and fallen over one of those chairs. So what I do, I get the handy iPhone flashlight out, right? And that's kind of what happens when you open yourself up to the Holy Ghost. It's like you turn on that faith flashlight, and now you can see, instead of stumbling around in a dark world. That's really what the Holy Spirit does. He guides us into God's truth so we can live with clarity and purpose instead of this constant worldly confusion that we see all around us. Now, in the Bible, there's a lot of different ways that the Holy Spirit would reveal. And I just want to show, I'm just going to show you three of them, because I think it helps us wrap our, our brains around this. First, the Holy Spirit in the Bible, brings revelation to prophets and apostles. So in the Old Testament, you see the Holy Spirit of God speak to the prophets, and then the prophets deliver God's word to God's people. But then you also see this in the New Testament through the apostles. And today, the revelations became the scripture we have. As it says in 2 Peter 1, 21, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the power of the Holy Spirit. But here's what a lot of people miss. It's like some people think, so, okay, so the Holy Spirit was kind of like the author behind the words in the Bible, but then he realized he wrote the greatest book of all time, so he just shut, he just shut it down, right? Nothing else. No, the Holy, we don't change the Word of God. That's not what I'm saying, but the Holy Spirit continues to reveal God's truth to us today. John 16, 13 teaches us that. He is still actively revealing God's Word to us today. He reveals, there's a second thing, by teaching and illuminating things. By teaching God's word and by, by illuminating things, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would remind his followers of everything he taught, John 14, 26. The Spirit opens our eyes to understand Scripture. 
Reading this book is different than reading any other book because this book isn't really a book. It's the alive, living, breathing, active word of God. And when we get into this book, the spirit's there. The question's not, is he there? The question is just, are you open to it or not? But even more beautiful than that, I think, for us, he just leads us and guides us and illuminates and teaches in those little everyday moments. We have big dramatic moments and we all learn in those, but what about, I'm talking about everyday life. I'm talking about how life normally is. Just those everyday decisions. Did you know the Spirit is actively desiring to guide you through those as well and speak to you in those as well? Romans 8, 14. He teaches and he illuminates everything everywhere for the Christian. Last, he gives evidence of God's presence, and I love this one. The Holy Spirit gives evidence of God's presence. He makes the presence of God known everywhere, everywhere. His work is visible through our spiritual gifts. His work is visible through miracles. That wasn't just in the Bible. Miracles still can and do happen today. He transforms environments with the peace of God, the love of God, the unity of God, reflecting God's nature, Romans 14, 17. Meaning every environment you walk into can be an environment that is illuminated by the love of God if you just decide to walk in and listen to the Holy Spirit. About a year ago, some friends of mine, Charity and J.P. Phillips, opened a really cool food truck. They're members of our church. Uh, It's called Bougie Bowls. What a great name, right? And just recently... Uh, they, they shifted from food truck to brick and mortar. Big victory. You should go check it out. This isn't a commercial, but it's totally a commercial. <laughs> they make these little bowls of fruit, and they're just so good at like getting the combinations of the fruit right, and then they put a little bit of goodness on top, like Nutella, stuff I'm not supposed to eat, but it's so good, right? And I can't figure out if it's breakfast or lunch or dessert, but I love it. You should go get you a bougie bowl. They're out on 78. But what I wanted to point out is when they opened up their brick and mortar, every time I've been in there, when you walk in, you just feel this is a different kind of environment. You can just tell. And there's not like a weird Jesus statue when you walk in that you have to touch. (laughs) It's not that. I think they do have maybe some scripture on the wall or something, but but it's, you know what I mean? It's not like this weird thing and it's not like you walk in and go, oh God, this is different and you want to leave. It's more like you walk in and you can just feel the presence of God. And it's a place that sells bowls of fruit, (laughs) y'all. Amazing bowls of fruit, but bowls of fruit, right? But you walk, what is that? It's because Charity and JP have said, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. We want this to be a place that gives evidence of the presence of God. Would you use us to transform this environment each and every day that we open up those doors for every single customer that walks into this place? And I've seen them pray with people. I've seen them greet people in the name of the Lord. I've seen them encourage people spiritually. And what I'm trying to tell you is that doesn't only happen at church and it doesn't only happen at bougie bowls. That will happen anywhere you say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Use me to transform this environment. Anywhere. Your workplace. Your family dinner table. One of the places I think it needs to happen the most. Wherever and whenever God has you, the Holy Spirit reveals. Okay, next. Ephesians 3 says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power. Power through his spirit in your inner being. So the Holy Ghost empowers us. He empowers us. You, you can have all the right tools and talents. Um, you could have notes from every sermon for the last four years. You could have gone to, to every uh, Bible study and then every advanced Bible study You could have all the right intentions, but it's the Holy Spirit that fills you with the power of God that you need to serve God in this dark world and to just magnify the name of Jesus and bring his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven to a reality. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Without him, there's no wind in the sails. It's like we remain still, but when he breathes life into our efforts and we open ourselves up to that power, we are now empowered in a supernatural way to do things we could never do in our natural lives. In the Old Testament, the Spirit often empowered people for special tasks. I'm going to go quick. You might want to jot some of these down and look at them later. He gave Joshua leadership and wisdom, Numbers 27. 
He strengthened the judges, Gideon and Samson, to deliver Israel, Judges 6. He came upon Saul and David to equip them for their kingship, 1 Samuel 16. He even empowered craftsmen who were building the tabernacle to be filled with the Spirit as they built this environment for God, Exodus 31. The Holy Spirit was actually present during the Exodus, Isaiah 63. And after the exile, God's Spirit gave His people protection and peace, Haggai chapter 2, verse 5. The Holy Spirit even intervened throughout Scripture, like when He came upon Saul's men, and He stopped them supernaturally from capturing David, 1 Samuel 19. And then the Old Testament also foretold of a time when the Holy Spirit would anoint the Messiah, filling Him with wisdom, understanding, and power, Isaiah 11, verse 2. Isaiah said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and Jesus quotes that to announce his earthly ministry in Luke 14, 8, or Luke 4, 18. Incredible stuff how you see the Holy Spirit all through the Bible, empowering people. And then you get to the New Testament. And this is important because a lot of people think the Holy Spirit like was on pause or something and didn't show up until Pentecost. But no, he's been there all along, right? And, and so when Jesus said, like, I will give you the Spirit, he wasn't saying, well, he's never been here, but suddenly he's going to show up on the scene. He was just saying there's a, there's a fullness of the work of the Spirit that's about to begin to happen, a part of the new covenant. You go to the New Testament, the Holy Spirit's empowering work is seen most fully in Jesus' life. When Jesus is baptized, Matthew 3, 16, the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove and remains with him throughout his ministry, empowering him to preach and to heal and, and to perform miracles. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus operated in the power of the Spirit all the time. And here's the crazy thing. The same exact Holy Spirit is the one you and I have. The Bible never says Jesus got a steroid juiced up version of the Holy Spirit and we got the puny version. No, we have the exact same spirit, the exact same power. Jesus actually said one time, you will do even greater works than I have done in this world by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that, my heart resonates with it. And I just want to say, yes, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Yes, Holy Spirit, you're welcome in and through my life. Yes, Holy Spirit, use me. Yes, Holy Spirit, use our church. What about you? Last, the Holy Ghost reflects our response. And keep your pen out, because I have a better way to say that, but it's just really long. And I thought this was an easy way to remember. The Holy Ghost reflects our response. Here's the long way, maybe a little more concise. This is the application for the day. The Holy Spirit shows stronger or weaker evidence of the presence and the blessings of God according to our response to Him. You follow me? I'll say it again. The Holy Spirit shows stronger or weaker evidence of the presence and blessing of God according to our response to Him. Let me tell you what this means and what it means for you, okay? So many stories in the Old Testament and the New Testament show us and teach us that the Holy Spirit will bestow blessing, or at times withdraw blessing based off whether or not we're open to him moving in our lives. So Jesus, for example, we know Jesus was completely without sin and the Holy Spirit remained on him. It says in John chapter 1 verse 32, it says that the Holy Spirit was given to Jesus without measure, John 3 34. But then we see like Samson is a great example. In the Old Testament, you read Judges chapter 13, 14, 15, and it says the Holy Spirit came on Samson, the Holy Spirit came on Samson, the Holy Spirit came on Samson. Then you read Judges 16, and Samson decides to remain in his sin, and so it tells us that the Holy Spirit departed from Samson as he persisted in his sin. But that's Old Testament. It tells us that Saul stayed disobedient, and the Holy Spirit departed from Saul. It tells us over and over and over in the Old Testament that Israel would rebel and grieve the Spirit of God, and then the Spirit of God would turn against them. Stephen rebuked the Jewish leaders, and he said, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Now, good news is we're a part of the new covenant. The Holy Spirit doesn't like come upon us and then leave us. The Holy Spirit's not like, hey, how's it going? We're best friends. You're doing great. Nah, not about you anymore. I'm out. That's not the Holy Spirit now. Now the Holy Spirit dwells within us, but there's still a great lesson for us. Ephesians 4, Paul says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So we're taught the Holy Spirit, He doesn't leave us, but He can be grieved. 
1 Thessalonians, Paul exhorts the Thessalonian church, do not quench the Spirit. We can quench the Spirit. We can grieve the Spirit. We can ignore the Spirit. We can ghost the Holy Ghost. And then it says in Galatians 5, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So the answer is to keep in step with the Spirit. The point is this, the Holy Spirit's power does not ever change in any way whatsoever in our lives. He doesn't grow stronger or weaker in his essence, but what does change is our openness to his leading and his guidance in our lives. And that determines how we experience his power and his presence in our lives. The more we surrender to him and say yes to him, receive from him, listen to him, the more we're changed and the more we see his transformative power at work in so many ways in our lives. The Holy Spirit doesn't change, but our experience of his power and presence varies based on our response to him. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can quench the Holy Spirit, or we can say, I will walk in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit and keep in step with him. I mentioned fire earlier. Imagine the Holy Spirit like a fire. It's a great picture. Have you ever had a little family fire powwow at the fire pit? I mean, this is San Antonio, so probably no. But that one day, y'all, when it gets down to 72 degrees, fire pit, right? And if you're having fun with your family and it's getting late into the night, what do you do? You keep shoving fuel in the fire, more firewood. Let's keep telling stories. Let's keep hanging out with the kids. This is so good. I love being with my friends. More, more fuel, more firewood. But then at the end of the night, you get up and you leave the fire. And what happens? The fire goes out. The fire's gone within a couple hours. You still have all the elements for the fire there, but, but there's no fire there because you stopped fueling that fire. It's a great picture of the Holy Spirit. And so what I want to tell you today is don't ghost the Holy Ghost. Feed the fire and fan the flame. Have you ever had to start a fire out in the wilderness? You get some kindling and if you have one of those little cheap striker things, right? And all you need is a little flame and then you what? You fan that flame and that flame begins to grow into a fire that burns hot fire that can bring warmth, a fire that can bring change. Stay responsive to the Holy Spirit. Would you stand up on your feet? When you sense his leading, I just want to ask you, don't resist. We resist for so many reasons, but we need to feed the fire and fan the flame. Time in God's word, time with God's family, time in prayer, simple obedience to Jesus where we just say yes to him. And then when behaviors and sinful habits creep in that dishonor God, what do we do? We confess them quickly and we turn and we run back to God. I'm just trying to help you see that the Holy Spirit's power in your life, it's directly linked to how much space you give the Holy Spirit to move and work in your life. How open you are to him and what he wants to do. So I want to sing, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And I want to invite you, if you need prayer for anything, whether it's just to say, yes, Holy Spirit, and praying with somebody would help you do that. Or maybe you're struggling in your marriage. You've, you've got an addiction you're dealing with. There's a, a financial issue. There's a business decision. There's something you've been praying about, and you need clarity. Or how about this? You know you need salvation. You know that it's time to say yes to Jesus Christ.